COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, but that doesn't mean it leaves the rest of the body alone. Far from it. And as recent research shows, what it does to the brain could be lasting and potentially devastating. With us on what science has learned so far, in Malton, England, Ava Easton, health scientist and chief executive at the Encephalitis Society and a member of the WHO World Health Organization's COVID-19 Neural Research Coalition. In Kingston, New York, Jennifer Frontera, professor of neurology at NYU Langone School of Medicine and a member of the WHO's Brain Health Neurology and COVID-19 Forum. And in my hometown of London, Ontario, Adrian Owen, professor of Western University's Brain and Mind Institute. Thank you all for being on the show. And Ava, I'm sure when I said encephalitis, you said that's not how we say it, because <laughs> I know over there you say uh, encephalitis, right? Uh, we do say encephalitis, but I have got a big sign in front of me with it's spelt with an S underlined so that I remember I've got to say encephalitis for you guys. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you know, before uh, we've been looking forward to this conversation because there is a lot of talk right now about COVID's impact on the brain. And we're very excited to learn from the three of you. And before we begin our discussion, I just wanted to share some numbers with you all and the audience. Um, a study of more than 236,000 people in the United States found 34% of patients with COVID-19 were diagnosed with a neurological or mental health disorder within six months of infection. A neurological or psychiatric diagnosis occurred in 38% of those who had been admitted to hospital, 46% of those in intensive care, and 62% of those who had delirium during their COVID-19 uh, infection. Ava, I wanted to start with you. Um, you know, what are some of the mental and uh, neurological symptoms associated with COVID that we are seeing? Well, there's obviously the things that people will be familiar with, such as loss of smell and taste, uh, but people have been experiencing neurological problems such as stroke, encephalopathy, such as encephalitis, or ADEM, otherwise known as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Um, that's in hospitalised patients, but of course outside of that we've got many non-hospitalised patients uh, reporting uh, this syndrome known as long COVID, so a whole range of neurological problems that they're suffering um, despite not having been hospitalised by the condition. And Jennifer, one person suffering from cognitive issues with COVID said, and I quote, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. Your body just, it feels like it's breaking down, you lose your sense of self. How debilitating can some of these uh, neurological issues be? Uh, yeah, so definitely folks that are suffering with long COVID, particularly I think the cognitive sequelae that people are mentioning, um, it can be very debilitating. We looked at this in um, a survey of about a thousand people, some of whom had COVID, some of whom did not. And we sort of tried to adjust for stressors that are pandemic related, social isolation, financial insecurity and so forth. And um, at least 25% of the people who had COVID were dealing with long COVID symptoms for a median of about four months. And 50 to 70% of those patients said that the symptoms were significantly interfering with their ability to go to work, uh, enjoy leisure activities or do household activities. So very debilitating types of symptoms that people are facing. And I'm guessing too, it must be very scary. Yes, we're learning a lot about COVID as we go, uh, but from the patients that you've seen, what's it like to realize that it's not just something that's happening um, to your body, but it's something that you might have to deal with long-term? Uh, I, I think people are uh, legitimately frightened. Um, a lot of people can't do their normal activities. People even complain about inability to read text messages or emails because of brain fog, much less do uh, high level cognitive tasks that might be required for their jobs. So, uh, you know, when we look at hospitalized patients, we followed a cohort of um, 4,500 hospitalized patients uh, at six months and 12 years. And at six months, 47% of them could not return to work who had been working previously. So that's a potential large unemployment problem that we might be facing simply because of sequelae of, of COVID. And Adrian, you just completed a study with uh, COVID-19 survivors. What's the range of issues that you've heard uh, about? 
Well, we've been particularly interested in in cognition, how cognition is affected by COVID-19. And by that, I mean things like memory, attention, people's ability to make everyday decisions, what we call reasoning. Uh, and we were interested in how they relate to mental health uh, issues, things like depression and anxiety. And we, 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 as, as you say, we just reported on about 500 patients. And, and there we saw quite profound deficits, in particular with speed of thinking. People were really slowed down in, in how quickly they could think through problems. And also their ability to make simple decisions was impaired. And the really important thing is that these were closely related to the severity of COVID symptoms. So the, the worse your physical symptoms, the worse your, your cognitive symptoms are likely to be following recovery. I was going to just follow up with that. So because we do know that some people have COVID and they don't even realize that they have it and some people uh, end up in hospital. So you're saying that, you know, the worst your symptoms, uh, the, um, or the severity of your infection are, is the worst of your symptoms? That, that's true, except we, we then wonder, well, is it just about being in hospital? Is it just the patients that really have extremely severe reactions and end up in hospital, perhaps on ventilators? And it turns out that's not the case. So even though those patients have a harder time in the long term cognitively, even patients who have very mild symptoms and even perhaps are asymptomatic will experience or will likely experience cognitive consequences down the line. Um, and Ava, you know, some people might think that it's the stress and the anxiety of contracting COVID that might be creating uh, these problems. Uh, is there any truth to that or is that too simple an explanation? Well, I think what we do know, like other viruses um, that affect the brain, we know that COVID is causing problems in the brain directly. Um, you know, there's been a, a range of debate about how that's actually happening. But my specialty is encephalitis. And we know with those patients that they go on to ex experience a whole range of problems afterwards as a result of the injury to the brain that's occurred, whether their encephalitis was caused by their own immune system or by, uh, or by infection. Jennifer, I'm Jennifer. going to put you on the spot here and just ask you the big question, I guess. A lot of us are wondering, um, should we consider COVID-19 a brain disease? I think certainly the sequelae of COVID-19 absolutely affects the brain. Whether or not we're talking about direct viral invasion of the brain, which is, I think is controversial um, and not necessarily clearly the mechanism of brain injury, or if we're talking about secondary effects, autoimmune effects, um, having low oxygen, for example, if you have severe COVID, um, the hyperinflammation response from COVID, can certainly all affect the brain, as well as uh, people have uh, nerve problems, muscle problems as well, um, following COVID infection. So um, I think the spectrum of, of neurological diseases has been reported and um, is an issue. Uh, Adrian, I saw you nodding. Yeah, I mean, I, the example I often use is, is of cardiac arrest. I mean, outside of pandemic times, most of the patients that I see that have very severe brain damage that has been caused by cardiac arrest. But you know, most people will say to me, but that's a heart issue, that's not a brain issue. But cardiac arrest leads to an interruption of the oxygen supply to the brain, and that will therefore detrimentally affect your brain and perhaps cause brain damage. And I think we need to think of COVID in very similar terms. It's ostensibly a respiratory disorder. It is affecting oxygen, it is affecting blood, uh, 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 the flow of oxygen to the brain. And therefore, you know, even if it isn't, affecting the brain directly, it is very likely having effects on the brain. Well, should uh, do we know what is causing these uh, neuro neurological effects? I, I mean, I think as you've just heard, there are, there are many possibilities. They, they could be direct, they could be, uh, you know, a direct viral invasion of the brain. And there's, there's some emerging evidence for that, but I doubt that's the case for every patient. Um, it could be an immune, uh, an extreme uh, immune system response that leads to inflammation in the brain that could be more severe than the virus itself. But it, actually, I'm, I'm more concerned about these sort of indirect effects, things like interrupted oxygen supply. And this is particularly true for people who end up in the ICU. I mean, if you're on a ventilator, you are going to have an interrupted oxygen supply to your brain. And actually, we published a paper just two years ago of, of ICU survivors. This is pre-COVID. But these were people who were in the ICU for non-brain-related reasons. 
but every single patient left the ICU with cognitive impairments. And it's likely that it's, it's these indirect effects that were, that were influencing them there. Well, you mentioned uh, the interruption with oxygen. What else could be an ind indirect cause? Uh, well, of course, you, uh, I mean, blood clots in the, uh, in the periphery of the body. We, we do know that in some patients, it, it seems possible that it may be more common in younger patients are developing uh, blood clots, and we don't know why that is. It's perhaps due to some uh, effect on coagulation in the blood, but that will, again, interrupt the oxygen supply uh, you know, to, to the brain, and it could have quite profound effects. Um, Ava, is COVID-19 directly infecting the brain? Um, I think the jury's out on that. I think there are some papers that are suggesting that um, there is direct viral invasion into the brain. But I think the consensus more generally is that there's probably some kind of autoimmune reaction going on. Um, and also, um, you know, so some of the other implications that we just heard from Adrian there. I wanted to play a, a clip from an interview we did earlier this year with science journalist Donna Jackson Nakazawa on the link between the immune system and mental health. Sheldon, please roll. I saw enormous amount of research coming out about 12 years ago, starting to link autoimmune diseases with also cognitive shifts in the brain. For instance, individuals with lupus are more likely to experience cognitive changes, depression, anxiety. Individuals with schizophrenia, when they were doing bone marrow transplants on individuals with schizophrenia, and they would ostensibly help to replace the immune cells in the body, schizophrenia symptoms would resolve. And you began to look at these studies as a science journalist and think, what is the link between the way in which the immune system can undergo enormous shifts in inflammation and autoimmune disease and the changes that we begin to see in the brain? Uh, Jennifer, I wanted to follow up on that, on the link. How does this growing understanding of the link between the immune system and the brain factor in here? So I think some of the hypotheses are that um, just like with any other autoimmune disease, when your body produces antibodies to fight a virus or a bacteria or anything, um, sometimes those antibodies recognize uh, portions of the body itself. They kind of cross-react. Um, it's an unfortunate accident that they're recognizing the wrong thing, but they can attack your own body, which can then produce a variety of different symptoms. Um, and in that clip you showed, she referenced lupus, which certainly has a variety of neurological symptoms associated with it. Um, which antibodies, autoantibodies might be involved is still a question. I think there's a lot of candidate autoantibodies that are just sort of being discovered at this point, and people are really working on flushing out whether that's uh, the case or not. And I, I think it's important to note um, that probably not all of long COVID is autoimmune. Some of it might be. We're probably looking at something that's very heterogeneous, and it's going to take a little bit of time to tease apart because the people that were sicker and hospitalized are facing sequelae that are not uncommon amongst critically ill patients. Um, as Professor Owens mentioned, um, low oxygen levels. Sometimes people have renal failure or other organ failure that can affect their brain function. That's one thing in the very sick patients. And then in those who were less ill with the initial COVID, um, there's probably a variety of mechanisms at play, one of which is likely to be uh, an autoimmune mechanism, but there may be others. Um, the SARS outbreak in 2003, uh, and this is for you, um, Adrian, and MERS outbreak in 2012, both caused by coronavirus is similar to the one that causes COVID-19. They were also associated with uh, neuro neurological illnesses. Um, are we in a much better position now in 2021 to understand the underlying cause of these issues? I don't know whether I would say we're in a, a much better position. Um, you know, we obviously have a much bigger problem this time around because there are, I don't know, I've lost count, 200 million or more uh, cases. So, you know, yes, um, we have previously seen uh, neurological sequelae like, like this. We've seen cognitive deficits that sometimes go on for years as a result of coronavirus infection. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't think we're in, we're in a better 
uh, situation for understanding this right now. Uh, in some ways, we're in a better situation, uh, you know, having been through it before, we know what to look for, and we, we've managed to mobilize very quickly. I mean, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies of, of COVID-19 so far, and people have been amazing at sort of, uh, you know, pivoting their labs to, you know, to start to look at these things. So in that sense, uh, we got going quickly, and that's some something of an advantage. But you know, I, I don't think we know a lot more about where these problems are coming from than we did perhaps 20 years ago. And Ava, do we know how long uh, some of these cognitive uh, effects associated with uh, COVID can last in people? Well, I don't. I don't think we do. I think it's early days. Um, you know, there's much more research needed. Um, so that's a difficult thing for us to tell. If we look at other comparable conditions, I think. Um, you know, we, we could say some people will make a good recovery, but unfortunately, I think there's every chance that, uh, you know, a significant minority will go on to experience problems in the longer term. Um, Adrian, I saw you. Uh, I saw your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, in our study, again, this was only 500 patients, but two things are important to bear in mind. One is that they none of them were in the throes of COVID-19. They'd all recovered from the initial infection, yet they were still... Uh, presenting with quite profound cognitive impairments. The other thing to bear in mind is that all these patients had received a positive test. That's how we uh, ensure that they had actually had COVID-19. And the, there was no relationship uh, between the severity of symptoms and how long it was since they'd had the test. Now, one, one way of thinking about that is, OK, things aren't getting any worse over time. But of course, the flip side of that is that things probably aren't getting any better either. Now, we're going to follow these patients for a year or more to find out what happens to them. But, but right now, these deficits look to be stable to us. Uh, when, you say, when we talk about these uh, deficits, these impairments, Jennifer, do we know whether or not they're permanent? So what I can say is when we looked at patients six months after the first wave in New York City, that 50% of those patients who had been hospitalized had cognitive deficits on formal testing, um, which was surprisingly high number. Um, and, you know, frankly, a lot of people don't even realize they have cognitive deficits, which is part of um, not uncommon for dementia type processes, but also not uncommon for other types of memory disorders. Um, when we looked at people who had not been hospitalized, and this is a much, much smaller sample, um, the patients that reported having prolonged COVID symptoms um, went on for about four months on, on average. Some people were reporting symptoms over a year. Um, and the most common symptoms were anxiety and brain fog and fatigue. Um, when we try to parse apart contributing factors of stressors related to the pandemic, the one symptom that really still seems to be significantly present in the, those patients was the cognitive deficits. A lot of the other um, psychological effects, depression, anxiety, and so forth, um, were much more closely tied to other stressors in their life, social isolation, um, financial issues, um, relationship problems at home because you're locked up with other folks. Um, so. Uh, I think the story, as, as others on this panel have mentioned, I think at the end of the day will be the cognitive story. And we are, you know, we talk about learning things about COVID, but we're also learning things about other diseases. So, for example, what does protracted low oxygen levels do to your brain? So people are starting to look at neurodegenerative biomarkers in the blood now that we have much more sensitive assays that we can do this in hospitalized patients. And, you know, I can say even in our uh, early data, you know, our group and other groups have seen elevations in, in, in these blood biomarkers that you can see in patients that have um, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, including cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's type dementia. Not to say that we're, we're thinking these patients with long COVID will develop dementia, but we're starting to learn more about the fact that there really is some brain injury happening that you can actually measure. Uh, we know that the Delta variant is uh, more contagious. Um, schools in Ontario are opening in a few weeks. And I'm curious to know, um, does the age matter? Because we know kids' brains are still developing. So does it matter if your brain is still developing as a 13-year-old when you do get COVID and you start having these symptoms or someone my age? Uh, Jennifer? I mean, I have school-aged children, two, six, and nine. I know Adrian has a seven-year-old. Uh, 
I think we just do not know enough. And that makes me very concerned about what could happen to a, a young brain or a developing brain. We know that children are less likely to have symptomatic COVID, less likely to be hospitalized. Um, we have very little data on long-term development because this is such a new disease. So I don't think we know yet. I'm hoping it's, as we think, not very severe, but there's a lot of data that's missing. And, you know, as a parent, I, I still remain concerned for my my children. And Adrian? I mean, we do know that once you get to 18, there's not an age effect. So in our sample, um, actually age ha had no effect. Um, notwithstanding the fact that obviously a lot of older patients tend to have comorbidities and may as a result get more severe disease. But it isn't the case that we're only seeing cognitive deficits in the, in the elderly, for example. Um, we, for various reasons, didn't study people under the age of 18. But I, I don't see any reason to believe that this is, is necessarily going to be any different for younger people. I mean, there are a lot of people saying people of student age, you know, 18 to 25, aren't getting these impairments. And I can tell you that that isn't true. Uh, they are. We're certainly seeing them in our sample. Well, um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the 1918 flu. Um, and Ava, looking back uh, to the 1918 flu, can we learn anything from it on what the long tail of these effects could look like? Well, I think we can always um, learn from history. You know, the Spanish flu there was a half a billion people infected and 50 million people lost their lives during that time. And and those survivors did go on to have some of the problems that we've heard about, you know, fatigue, depression, sleep disturbances, et cetera. Um, but I think also one of the things with COVID is we don't know if those that have been infected by the virus will go on to experience uh, in the future, you know, any longer term impacts, um, such as susceptibility to other health complications later in life. You know, there, there were unanticipated outcomes of the Spanish flu, such as um, the birth of children after the uh, pandemic, um, which saw those children whose mothers had been pregnant with them during the pandemic, um, who experienced worse levels of health. They had a, a, an earlier death rate. Uh, they experienced higher rates of uh, things like diabetes and cancer and heart disease. So I, you know, from day one, I think COVID-19 has been a virus that has been very contrary um, I think what we thought we knew at all sorts of different stages early on, we realised we were wrong. So I don't know what it's got in store for us, but I think that there's always lessons to be learned from history. Uh, knowing what we do know now, uh, Jennifer, that we are learning a lot as we go um, looking forward. Do you think we are taking this seriously enough, the neurological fallout from COVID? Well, I, I, I can, I'm glad to say that there is a lot of funding from, um, at least in the US, from the NIH to look at this problem. Um, the Congress appropriated $1.4 billion to look at post-acute sequelae of COVID. And uh, so that's an ongoing effort. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're really going to be able to, to untangle a lot of what's going on here, get a better sense of trajectories of recovery um, and how people do in the long term, uh, cognitively other and otherwise. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to learn. I'm glad that uh, there's a lot of funding agencies that are putting money into this so um, people can really start to work on this. And Adrian, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it is a, a big problem that people need to take seriously. I mean, think about it. Uh, if you've got 200 million people in the world with, with this issue, even if, even if only 10% of them have long-term cognitive impairments or challenges, that's that's an awful lot of people. That's a big economic and societal problem. That's people that won't be able to go back to school, may, may not be able to fulfill all of their daily activities, may not be able to, to go back to work. You have to think about it in those terms. And 10% right now is looking like a very low estimate to me. So I, you know, I, I think we do need to take this very seriously. Uh, Eva, do you think that policymakers are taking this seriously enough? Um. I think, to be honest, uh, no, I don't. I think we're all in for quite a rude awakening. I think there are going to be huge policy uh, and practice implications, uh, in particular for health and rehabilitation services. As Adrian just said there, you know, we've got an awful lot of people um, affected by COVID-19. And I think the complexity of their rehabilitation needs um, 
services are going to need to be prioritised. Um, and for those related to health and rehabilitation, I think they've really got to think about the long term focus. I think they've got to think about their services being innovative and scalable. I think they've got to be um, manned by multidisciplinary teams. And I also think that we need to think about how we're going to embrace patient organisations in the non-profit sector, I think are going to have a big role to play in this in terms of delivering self-management programmes and, and supporting traditional healthcare. Um, I can only imagine the anguish um, of surviving COVID and then having uh, these uh, effects. You don't know how long they're going to last. You don't know uh, if you can do your job. Um, Jennifer, um, to give people an idea, you know, what treatment options do we have for people who are suffering from these uh, neurological and cognitive effects of COVID? Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because at the moment, so much research has been focused on trying to figure out mechanisms of injury and what actually is going on that we haven't gotten so much to the step of trying to um, help these patients recover. Certainly, there are uh, cognitive rehab type of therapies that depend on your domains of dysfunction that you might have, um, as well as physical therapy for those that are still uh, suffering from lung dysfunction or cardiac dysfunction related to COVID. Um, there's, uh, for fatigue, there's a variety of different uh, pharmacologic interventions that people could try that anecdotally in the patient community of long COVID survivors uh, ha have been helpful. Um, I think we're still very much at the, the early stages of this. Um, and uh, I think a lot more work needs to go into developing therapeutics for these patients who are really suffering. The one thing that we know helps people is please get vaccinated. Yep. Um, avoid COVID in the first place. Um, if you've had COVID, there are some anecdotal reports that vaccination does help folks feel better. Um, still trying to understand why that might be the case, but there is no downside. There's only upside to being vaccinated. And I think studies are just coming out looking at side effects of vaccination. Like uh, the New England Journal just published a paper yesterday. And, you know, though there are side effects of vaccination, they are vanishingly smaller than the side effects you get from having COVID itself. And I think we can feel confident that these vaccines are safe and that they're the right thing to do um, for people to avoid these types of neurological problems in the future. Thank you for that. And thanks again to all three of you. Uh, we really do appreciate your insights tonight. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.